have Matt in my lab. I'm happy that he's still around and still interacting with the MVC, although he has formally moved on to his postdoctoral position. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt today to tell us about what he's been doing along the lines of behavioral genomics. Thanks, Great. Thanks Eileen. I really appreciate the nice words. <laughs> I, I don't know, Jeremy or Katie or somebody back there could just dim the lights a, a hair. Okay, perfect. So, I remember last year, I guess it was Sean Revito's talk, and he, I'm going to call you out, Sean, sorry. He stood up here and he said, gosh, you know, something along the lines of, it's terrifying to stand up here. And I remember sitting back almost where Sean was sitting, the very back, thinking, God, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem too terrifying. <laughs> I don't know. But I'll admit, it's actually kind of terrifying, so bear with me. Um, so, because this is technically my finishing talk, um, I'm going to spend the first kind of 10 minutes or so talking about the people that have been important to me during this graduate career. Um, there are so many people. I'll start out with my family, of course. Um, two of them are here. I think everyone's seen them. This is Avery here, Bridget back here, and of course my wife, Kate. And Kate particularly, she has just been amazing. She's put up with me coming from New York, where we're originally from, to Michigan, where the weather was very cold, and now <laughs> California, where, of course, it's um, wonderful. <laughs> um, we've been to the field. She went to me, uh, or went with me to, I think, two evolution meetings uh, in Idaho and Portland. We've been to the field, you know, a hundred times, I don't know what. Um, so she's really been, you know, she's been amazing. It's been um, something that I could not have done without her, so thank you. Um, my daughter, Kayla, she's a uh, Princess, of course. <laughs> Owen uh, loves hot dogs and the beach. <laughs> Avery, do you see your picture up there? Avery, this was taken in the desert a couple of months ago, I guess. My little pumpkin here who's sitting over here. And my 63 pound wrestler. She's uh, decided she wants to wrestle, and today is her first meet, so I'm not sure whether I'm wow. freaking out more about this talk or her getting beat by some big oaf tonight. <laughs> um, Patrick, he's, despite my best kind of intentions, is somewhat of a budding herpetologist. Yay. <laughs> uh, next up is Eileen. Now, I. When I came to Berkeley, you know, seven years ago or whatever, I was pretty sure there was some sort of administrative mistake that let me in. We, you know, we talked on the phone, and I thought it had gone all right, but, you know, I wasn't really sure. And so she, you know, I guess had the vision or, or something, um, maybe not the vision, I don't know, to <laughs> accept me into the program. And she's been really fantastic with you know, kind of mentoring me when I needed it and letting me do stupid things when that was more beneficial <laughs> and, you know, through all of it really, you know, just being wonderful. So, thank you. Um, Julie, doing what she does best, holding baby things. <laughs> um, it was either this or the picture of Julie in a kayak with, uh, you know, hugging the killer whale, but this was, you know, seemed more appropriate. Of course, Julie um, was a fellow 2005 entered into the program and she has been you know there really through every step you know um, it's been great Uli who I'm um, I guess looking around the room you know surprised at how very few people probably know him still he was a graduate I guess two years ago and um, read I think every one of my chapters talked a lot I stayed with him during my first weekend in Berkeley and so he was you know really instrumental in me coming to Berkeley he was one of these guys that you know really made it feel like like it was the right thing sorry Sean <laughs> um, I shared an office with Juan Parra and Sean Arito for the first well for actually for my entire graduate career I think um, and uh, Juan Parra of course was uh, very insightful thoughtful uh, person always had really, you know, on you know, just great advice, and uh, and I really learned a lot from him. Sean, of course, provided for my moral compass. <laughs> he me, don't hide back there. <laughs> he taught me kind of really important details about graduate school and life. Like for instance, 
which staircase to walk down to as you're going to <laughs> Ivy Seminoff. These are really important details that many people overlook, and I was lucky enough to really to have Sean there to help me. And, but in reality, Sean was actually, uh, you know, a really wonderful mentor and um, put up with a lot of kind of silliness probably for me. So thanks. And there's like a million people, right? <laughs> and this is what makes the museum so great. And I could have probably. I don't know, 10 more slides just like this, full of people. And there's many people in this room that, of course, I've, I've neglected to put up here. But um, I'll just make mention of our front office staff here, Anna Ippolito, um, particularly. These guys really you know, provide so much for us. And we um, you know, should make sure to thank them. I don't know if Anna's in the room. No. Of course, um, my uh, district, oh, Molly Mitchell, who um, was just wonderful. She was here during my first three or four years of, of my graduate career. Uh, my orals committee, Walt, Rory, Rodrigo, who some of you may know, and of course Craig. And this is Craig in his, I guess, more festive attire. <laughs> <laughs> um, Monica, Shobi, of course, uh, the two gyms, really everybody. So, um, you know, you don't really leave uh, you don't really recognize how wonderful a place is until you leave. And now that I've left kind of a little bit, you really kind of, you know, look back and, and think about what a great place this really is. So um, lastly, I just want to make a plug for the kind of non-traditional student. And I'm sure there are people out here who just, you know, are discouraged from pursuing a career, you know, a graduate career for whatever reason. So I got my first degree in nursing back in 1999. And this was my kind of typical, you know, workplace. So there's a there's a patient behind there. You can't see him, um, but there's somebody back there. And I decided pretty early on that, I, you know, gosh, it was exciting and fun, and, you know, but I didn't really want to do it for the rest of my life. It wasn't something that I could, you know, that I could do. And so I went back to, you know, went back to school. And this is the University of Michigan. And lots of people. You know, said, oh, geez, you know, you've got this family, you know, you're going to have to work, and you just, you know, it's just not going to happen, you know, it's just you're not going to be able to do it. And there were people that were really discouraging in that regard, particularly like the um, <coughs> undergraduate counselor type people. <laughs> so, you know, you're working, you know, your grades, you know, my grades were not the kind of 4.0 grades that, that most Berkeley grad students have. And they said, geez, you know, it's just not going to happen. And so I just want people to know that this is, you know, something that you can do, really do, you know, if you put your mind to it, um, really forget about what people say and just go for it. Enough about that. Let's talk about some science, all right? So during my time here in the museum, I had, you know, a million projects, a million really cool things. And unfortunately, and sorry, since my practice talk, I took out basically all of the dissertation. I'm not going to be talking about many of these things. But what, what I am going to be talking about is chapter four, which slides in here. Um, has to do with Tuco genomics, more or less. If people are interested in talking about mating systems, or promiscuity, or MHC genes, or of course, um, gene expression in desert adapted mice, what I'm doing right now, I'm around and it'd be totally cool to, to chat about those things. So best I can remember, kind of midway through my graduate career, I became really obsessed with this genotype phenotype problem. And I've kind of come to think of it as a continuum, where on one end, down here, you have single genes of large effect. And there's really no problem. You have a gene, if you have it, you know, if you have this particular variant, you have sickle cell disease, or you have cystic fibrosis, or you have uh, round or wrinkled pea pods in the, in the situation where Mendel was. There's really no problem down there. In the middle, um, this is where the kind of candidate gene approach has been really, really helpful. Things like coat color in paramiscus, where there's maybe a handful of genes that are uh, that are involved, or beak morphology in the Darwin finches. Um, you know, there it's complicated, more complicated than this single gene thing, but maybe, maybe this is naive of me to say, but it's not super complicated, like things like heart disease or social behavior, bird song. Immune function, I think, kind of straddles the boundary there. And I'll remind you that just maybe two or three years ago, we had absolutely no way of understanding this stuff. The tools simply, they just weren't there. We didn't know how to, how to kind of even tackle these things. 
Now, in 2009, Eileen, I think it was Eileen anyways, challenged the members of her lab to come up with really their dream project, right? Like this craziest project ever. And of course, I had been thinking about genomes and genetics and social behavior. And I said, well, geez, you know, what if I could identify these genes underlying social behavior? What if I could do that? And I was, you know, I was thinking about this um, genome-wide association study approach, like was common in humans at that point. Um, but I didn't really have a good idea of how to go about it. I said, well, geez, you know, if I knew which genes, could I use, you know, something like RNAi, RNA interference, RNA interference, to get at causality? Now, I hope it's not crazy now, but it was actually pretty crazy then. These GWAS studies were really limited to humans or model organisms, and even the kind of type of transcriptome study that's, that's pretty common was pretty rare back then. This is, you know, 2009, just three years ago. So, less than a year later, in February 2010, Craig, in his kind of uncanny ability to see the scientific future, said, geez, you know, there's this uh, Lumina sequencing, and what, you know, can we use this technology to really, you know, understand or study the things that we study? You know, we don't study mice or humans or rats. We study these, you know, obscure, you know, rodents that are diverged from everything by 50 million years, or these lizards <laughs> that you know, have, has no, you know, nothing even close. And it was really lucky that we did this when we did. Now to put it into the context here, this is a graph where on the x-axis is time starting with 2001 and coming just about to the present and cost of raw megabasic DNA sequence. And as you can see, we're going on really nice here and then all of a sudden you get this rapid fall off. And basically right here is when Illumina sequencing kind of came onto the market. Here's my crazy idea, kind of in the middle of this fall, and down here is when we started this pilot project. So um, sequencing was really cheap, um, although it's kind of much cheaper now. And if we hadn't done it then, well, probably somebody else would have done it in some other museum, and you know we would have been behind the wave, I guess, which is where we did not want to be. Just for reference, I think Sanger sequencing is someplace up here, about maybe. 120, 130 dollars a megabase. I don't know. I was kind of guessing about that. So, anyways, um, in 2009, um, I sequenced the transcriptome from <coughs> a single individual of two species, Tenomus sociabilis and uh, Antonomus pierci. This was one social species and one solitary. And these animals were captured kind of. Well, I think they were incidental mortalities, if I remember correctly. So, there, this was really a you know an opportunistic study where there was really no study design. Um, and the project has come a really, really long way since that initial um, kind of pilot project. And so what I'm going to tell you about is really maybe two or three years of work taking um, the methods from their infancy to, say, adolescence. And now we're still working through some of the statistics of differential gene expression. So the results I'll present your preliminary, but I think um, these things should hold. So social behavior is one of the most readily observed natural phenomena. So if we open these windows, we might see birds, and those birds might be in flocks. And of course, that's social behavior. So in addition to social behavior, in addition to these birds, you have things like bats, wildebeest, and capybara, and elephants. Well, they all exhibit <coughs> one form or another of social behavior. And while we understand in general, that groups are maintained because benefits are greater than costs. Why there's so much variation is really an outstanding question. Um, for me, I can conceptualize this variation in terms of a continuum of home range overlap. So on one end, you have things like this tiger whose um, home range is virtually non-overlapping. They live alone. On the other end, things like these wolves, well, they live in groups. Their home range is almost completely overlapped. They're always together. And so kind of getting at the genetics of this transition is going to be what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of the hour. Well, I would argue that we have a pretty good handle on why social behavior occurs. Things like limited dispersal, social foraging, or defense, burrow maintenance, resource distribution, all of these things have been implicated in this study, or sorry, in the origin or maintenance of social behavior. The how, however, I think is a little trickier. Now, if you were around last year, 
to hear Julie's talk, Julie Woodruff, you'll know there are some important <coughs> endocrine components of social behavior, things like glucocorticoids. But when it comes to the genetics, we're more in the dark. We know some, mostly from social insects, but really we don't have a great handle on what's going on. Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Gene Robinson has really led this field of social genomics. And he kind of framed this problem perfectly in his 2011 science paper by this question. Does behavior evolve through gene expression changes in the brain in response to the environment? And kind of almost immediately, I said, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But which genes? And how do we find them? And well, are these the same genes in all social systems? Kind of how does this work? And none of these questions were really answerable at that time. So perhaps, not surprisingly, or maybe not, I don't know, there was very little overlap in terms of which genes were being identified as underlying social behavior. In 2001, uh, or sorry, in 2000, Larry Young, a study in voles, found that vasopressin <coughs> was kind of the gene. Uh, 2002 paper, cichlids, well, GnRH was the, was the thing. GABA, and a study on wasps. And of course, in the last maybe two or three years, there have been a whole bunch of papers, mostly in social hymenoptera, and identifying kind of a lot of genes. And I was just struck by this, you know, and, you know, there's really no overlap here, and maybe we shouldn't expect it, but it still, um, you know, was unusual. And I thought, well, maybe one particular reason is that the question was being asked in a slightly kind of wrong way, so to speak. So, for example, most of the studies that have looked to identify genes underlying social behavior have asked the question in really unrelated groups. So for instance, um, you know, they were looking at uh, bumblebees and they said, well, which genes are rapidly, are, you know, are, are rapidly evolving in, say, honeybees compared to bumblebees. And when you're looking at groups this far away in terms of their evolutionary distance, a multitude of factors could be involved in this transition, not the least of which is social behavior. So instead, what I, what I think I want to argue anyways, is that a system in which both ends of the spectrum are, um, are available in a single species may be a better way to go about asking these questions. And of course, it turns out, well, we have such a system. Um, as many of you know, rodents of the genus Tenomis represent a particularly rich system in which to, to, in which to test kind of hypotheses about social behavior. And one of these, uh, one of these species, Tenoma sociabilis, has been a, a focus of study by Eileen and others for more than 20 years. So, for say, 20 years she's gone to the field. Um, she's done marker capture studies, radio telemetry, she's characterized their resource distribution, she's done population genetics, and of course, there's poop. <laughs> right, and this is kind of uh, Julie's baby here. And I, I just have to say, you know, you're really, you really know in your system really well when you're studying their poop, right? I mean, how many of us can, can really claim to know about their study animals' poop? Just, it's impressive. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and so one of the things that had impressed me, and I think has impressed lots of people, is that there's so much variation in terms of social behavior. And so specifically, during their first year of life, yearling females make a critical choice. They can either stay home and be social, with their mother and sisters, or disperse into a more solitary lifestyle. Now we know this decision is critical. It's linked with differences in reproductive success, survival, baseline GCs. So we know this is a really kind of important um, stage for, for females. <clears throat> now let me be clear, ultimately, we're interested in studying this, uh, this transition in the wild, so down here in central Argentina. But because these animals are critically endangered, um, we just can't take the number of animals that, that we need to. Not to mention, this is um, the focus, or this population is the focus of a long-term behavior study, and I can verify <laughs> that these do not behave. So, thankfully, a healthy breeding colony exists just two floors up from here. And from this colony, we took 10, uh, 10 yearling females. We randomly relegated five of them to a more solitary lifestyle, and five to a more social lifestyle. We house these guys for uh, for 30 days in this condition. I should point out that that when I say we, what I really mean is Julie and Eileen, or maybe just Julie. She was the one that, that really was there every day, making sure the animals were fed and watered, and you know 
all of that stuff. So, um, so thanks is owed to Julie for this. Now, the uh, astute listener will recognize that in the field, animals disperse naturally. In the lab, well, we assign them to groups. And we were concerned about this and our, our potential to be skewing the, the, the outcome. And so we um, attempted to, to kind of worry about this a little bit by looking at patterns of fecal glucocorticoids. And when you compare these two groups to dispersers and thylopatric females in the field, their patterns of glucocorticoids are basically the same. So we, we know there are important differences between this, but we're relatively confident that at least some of the salient differences are, are there. So to get at gene expression changes related to this transition from solitary to social lifestyle, we, uh, we sequenced uh, purified MR, mRNA from the hippocampus. Now we chose the hippocampus specifically because, well, we knew something about it. Previous studies, both in Tucos and in other organisms, had shown that there are important differences in gene expression there particularly. So all samples were indexed with a unique barcode. And basically this means that every read we can attribute to a particular individual. So throughout the entire analysis, we know where everybody, you know, where everything came from. And that's, I think, a distinct advantage to our sampling. Um, we, we subjected these to Illumina sequencing, five samples per lane, time two lane, uh, times 100 base pair reads. And we got just a ridiculous amount of data. We're talking about um, after trimming, 476 million reads. That's 47 billion base pairs of data there. So it's just a ridiculous amount of data. Um, the reads are distributed roughly equally between the two, the two uh, groups. We have something like, I have it written down here, 242 million reads in solitary, 235 million reads in social. So we're talking about roughly a 3% difference between the treatment groups. Um, so I did a lot of the analyses, or most of the analyses anyways, on an SGI UV1000 at the Pit, uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. It's a computer called Blacklight. It has, um, in supercomputer world, a kind of small number of cores. But importantly, a shared memory architecture, which means that for a single run, you can access as much as 16 terabytes of RAM. So just a ridiculous amount of RAM. Um, we chose to, uh, to run the program Trinity specifically because Trinity, in I think a couple of papers, has been shown to have a low rate of chimerism and lots of full length transcripts. So this was one of the most, kind of, one of the best de novo transcriptome assemblers out there at the time. For us, we used 80 cores, which equaled about 640 gigabytes of RAM, and this um, de novo assembly took about 14 days. So it's a significant amount of, of computer time. So this is what Trinity gave me. And it's interesting that even the quote unquote best de novo assembler gave me just a ridiculous number of contigs, like 500,000 contigs. And so um, really early on, it became apparent that the challenge was not you know, to generate the de novo assembly because that seemed relatively easy, but instead to get you know, the junk out of there and retain the good stuff. And this is a problem I'll tell you I'm working with you know, really to this day. So the first thing I did was to remove low coverage contigs. These were contigs that were supported by less than 3x coverage. So stuff that was, um, well, might have been valid, but most likely not. I trimmed out all of these things. And as you can see, um, size on the x-axis, well, this is a histogram, right, with size on the x-axis, most of the reads that were removed were very small. Some big stuff, but mostly small stuff. Um, I then blasted those contigs to cavia, which was the closest genome to, to the tuco. And together, those, and then remove the stuff that didn't hit, um, didn't match to anything in, in the cavia genome. I removed something like 370,000 contigs. So just to, again, a ridiculous number of, of contigs, just gone. My N50 was about 5,000 base pairs. Um, and I've done some preliminary work to look at chimerism and stuff like that. And it looks like there's a very low rate of chimerism in the data set. So this is one of these silly slides that distills like eight months of work down into, you know, 10 words. <laughs> um, so I ended up, the final data set is about 120,000 contigs. I looked for SNPs in this, in this data set. I have something like 10,000 SNPs. Now this is amazing, given the two goes are kind of, at this point, world renowned for being very limited in their genetic diversity. Yet there's still a lot of variation to be found. Um, I compared the data set to MUS and found 28,000 unique transcripts. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. Um, specific genes, they're kind of all the things you would 
expect to be there. Melanocorticoid receptors, glucocorticoid receptors, DQ-alpha, DR-beta, you know, estrogen receptors, kind of all the stuff that you expect to be in the hippocampus of a mammal. There's also a fair amount of ribosomal RNA, and this is stuff we try to get rid of, um, but are, are usually unsuccessful, um, and unusually so, and I'd love to hear if anybody has a good explanation for this, very high coverage of the mitochondrial genome, something like a 1,000x coverage of the mitochondria. Um, and I definitely don't want that. So before going any further, I just want to talk about the biology of gene expression for a second. So when we say gene A it has higher expression in the social species, what we're really saying is that there are more copies of that particular transcript present in the cell. So uh, in this case, there are nine red lines and over here and three red lines over here. So all else being equal, you can say that expression is three times greater here. Now because our reads, what we actually generate from the sequence, <coughs> are derived from this pool of mRNAs, the two uh, the expression is directly proportional to the number of reads present. So, um, so the, or sorry, the number of reads is directly proportional to the um, to the amount of mRNA present in the beginning. So, this um, can be quantified in terms of this funny little metric, FPKM or fragments per kilobase of exon per million fragments mapped. And this is nice in that it controls for the length of the exon and the depth of coverage. So you can easily compare across experiments in between groups and stuff like that. Now taking a little more realistic example, shown here is a 977 base pair transcript. I don't know what this is. I, I knew at one point, but I forgot. <laughs> um, and the social animal, 2,408 reads mapped to it. While in the solitary animal, about 1,800 reads mapped to it. So all else being equal, we can say that expression is about 25% greater in the social animal. Okay, now before I kind of show you any real results, I want to convince you that this di digital gene expression stuff is kind of more than just hocus pocus, that it really actually works. So what I'm showing you here is um, bar plots from three different genes. Uh, corticotropin releasing hormone receptor one, receptor two, and glucocorticoid receptor. The blue guys are social and the brown is solitary. Um, FPKM on the, on the y-axis. Now here, this is work that Anna, uh, this is, uh, work that Anna Garrity has done using that old-fashioned technique called qPCR. <laughs> and now, the y-axis um, are different between my estimates and the qPCR-derived estimates, so they're not directly comparable. But what I do want you to see is that in, in R1 here, you have social just a little bit greater than solitary. Social just a little bit greater than solitary. And the receptor 2 pattern reverses, and lo and behold, it reverses here too. The glucocorticoid receptors, I have solitary expression being just a little bit higher than in social. Well, here QPCR got it wrong, or I got it wrong, one or the other. But anyways, the results are broadly similar, and so therefore, people who are using or who are using QPCR, um, no, in my estimation, maybe ought to switch if they're interested in scaling up. These results are broadly similar and less comparable. Now, scaling up just a titch. I wanted to look at the genes that Robinson and others had, uh, had, had shown to be involved in the evolution of the origin or maintenance of social behavior. And so the results are visualized in this heat map where um, high expression is in the darker colors, low expression is in the lighter colors, and you can see basically everything is the same between the social and solitary treatments. There's some differences, but there's no like, you know, really stark contrast. And in fact, when looking at the statistics, None of these are differentially regulated between the two groups. So all of the genes that, that um, were previously identified, well, not so much, at least not in two goes. Okay, so I just showed you the results of 10 or 20 genes, but now let's scale up to the whole data set, so 120,000 genes. Um, so um, this is a scatter plot with X, sorry, uh, with, so, with FPKM of the social individuals on the x-axis, solitary on the y. And really the point of this graph is just to show you that there are very close correlation between the two groups. Most everything is the same. So each dot, of course, represents the individual putative transcript or contig. So there are, of course, some outliers down here and up here, and maybe these are the guys that we're really interested in looking at. 
So another way we can get an idea about outliers is making a simple histogram where the x-axis consists of subtracting uh, mean solitary for, uh, FPKM from mean social FPKM. So zero would represent no difference, uh, no difference in expression between the two groups. And reassuringly, that's more or less what we get. Most all transcripts, you know, at least 80,000 transcripts are not differentially regulated. Their, their FPKMs are virtually identical. Now, um, the mean is 0 0.4, so we have a little you know, skew towards the social, uh, toward, towards expression in the social group, but not that much. Standard deviation about 13. Oh, sorry, <coughs> positive numbers in, indicate higher expression in social groups. So over here, all this stuff is, is overexpressed in the social treatment. Um, cufflinks, and so I use the program cufflinks to do all this differential expression testing for those of you that are interested in this stuff. Um, after all the corrections for uh, multiple tests and false discovery rate, well, it identified a single stinking transcript that was different. <laughs> so it's this guy down here, something like six standard deviations away from the mean. Anyway, so uh, this uh, single stinking uh, <laughs> gene uh, might actually be interesting now. It's the acetylcholine receptor, and uh, in mice, anyways, we know that it has to do with behavioral plasticity, arousal, reward. Well, and Tuco, who, you know, who really knows what uh, acetylcholine receptor could mean for Tuco's. This, um, of course, is a result that we'll follow up with um, in greater detail. So, just to point out, acetylcholine, re acetylcholine receptor, maybe you guys in the back can see it, but there are a whole bunch of little dots down here, and acetylcholine receptor is you know, one of those dots. And so, I was kind of troubled by the fact that, well, there are all these, well, you guys can't see it probably, but there's all these dots over here and up here, and there's even a dot way out here, you know, <laughs> that, where there's really high expression in the social group, but virtually none in the solitary. Well, why the heck weren't all those guys, you know, picked up by cufflinks? So, um, back to this graph, what I didn't tell you a second ago is although there's our trusty acetylcholine receptor that's um, identified as significantly differentially expressed, there's also like 600 genes out here. Now you can't see them because of the scale, but trust me, they're there. And so, why in the heck is cufflinks not you know, picking up these genes as well? And so, I really wanted to take a closer look at these genes to kind of figure out what was going on. And so here are three examples of genes that had a difference in FPKM greater than three standard deviations. So all of these genes we're talking about someplace out, out in this area here. Um, so initially, you know, I was, like I said, I was really unsure and, you know, they're all really well supported by the data and, you know, I didn't know what was going on. So I pulled them out. Um, here are three genes, calmodulin, septin, and calcineurin. All these genes have been previously identified as maybe involved in social behavior. So, you know, I recognized the names and so I decided to look at them more. And I think, and you know, I'm fairly confident what's going on, it's just there's tons of biological variability. So, you know, your mean numbers are, are really different here. This scale goes all the way up to 3,000, so I think this is like you know, 1,800, and this is like 1,500, so there's a lot of difference in average um, expression, but there's tons of biological variation. And this was maybe disheartening, or I don't know, maybe it shouldn't have been, uh, because these are lab animals, and in theory, this should be a very tightly controlled experiment where everything was the same except for you know, our trade of interest. Um, and so I guess what I'm... Uh, taken from this is that we have really low power, even in this best case scenario here, we have really low power to detect statistically different changes. And I did the quick power analysis, in fact, like an hour ago, and it looks like, um, <laughs> not, you know, we're not in terrible shape really. We need something like 17 animals. We have five, so we need an additional 12 animals per group. And I think that's well within our, our kind of resources. Um, and, you know, hopefully, you know, adding a few more samples will pick, you know, let us, <coughs> let us pick up some of these genes like calcineurin that may be important in the kind of origin or maintenance of social behavior. So, just in summary, social behavior in two goes, well, we need to sequence more. <laughs> and I was more or less, you know, not so convinced about this up until I started putting the talk together, or really mm -hmm. started putting the talk together. I think we need to do more sequencing. We need more individuals here. Even with our limited sampling, so five individuals per treatment group, we have some pretty interesting new potential genes, things that we can definitely follow up with with, with kind of targeted experiments. Lastly, together with the Broad, uh, we're sequencing the, or I should say, they are sequencing the genome. So hopefully when the genome comes, 
um, this will give us significantly more power to detect the types of things we're interested in. So in summary, back to uh, Gene, uh, Gene Robinson's questions here. Well, does behavior evolve via changes in gene expression? Well, I still think it's yes, but we have a ton of correlation, but no causation. Really, I think the focus should start to become this kind of issue of causation. So let's start doing the experiments that are really needed to identify what's under this. Which genes, how do we find them? Well, I'm pretty confident that this RNA-seq approach, like I've um, described here, is a pretty good approach to identify genes. And I think we can almost rule out this question. Well, I don't think it's the same genes. I think we have enough studies at this point to say that in each system, there's going to be a different set of genes underlying the transition. So with that, I'll just um, say thanks to my funding sources, and particularly to Craig, the director's fund, and the museum in general for providing kind of most of the uh, most of the money that helped uh, help with this um, help do this study. Um, I had a bunch of money from the NSF, from the NIH, the Chancellor's Fellowship, Exceed for the computing time, um, stuff from the UC NRS to go do field work, Sigma's I, IB. Anyways, the list goes on. Um, with that, I'll uh, take some questions. Thanks, Matt. Sean, you have the you have the opportunity to speak out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, for questions, please. Yes. I have two quick questions. One, sure. um, just so I'm clear on the experimental design. So you separated into five uh, solitary individuals and five uh, social individuals. Were those five social individuals in the same social circle, or were they each Different. in the independent? each in their own individual? Good. Okay. And then the second question is so. Uh, I don't know these the, the sorting of them. So in nature, they naturally seg they, they naturally segregate <laughs> into they decide whether they go solitary or they go and here, exactly. And here you parse them into exactly. and tried to make sure that things are okay. Yeah. Um, so what you might be finding if you're discovering differences in transcription then is uh, differences in transcription that result from different social situations, rather than differences in transcription that might be causing different Yeah, there's a cause and effect. Right. Yeah. You get an egg problem, for sure. Okay. Is there any way to change the experimental design to let them choose hmm. yeah. and then let them you know, raise them and then take yeah, them a couple years later? That's something that we had thought a lot about. And I think the short answer is no. I think just how, the, how the, the captive colony is designed, there's not an opportunity for animals to kind of choose their their housing situation. Uh, Julie or Eileen uh, yeah. may be able to speak to that more, but to the best of my knowledge, there isn't really a way, given our constraints, to, you know, to let that happen. That's obviously the, the right experiment to do. Jim? This is a stupid question, I, I think, but um, I'll ask it anyways. So is there any reason to think that some other part of the brain might be most relevant for this besides hippocampus? Yeah, I forgot to mention that we have, you know, five or six or seven different brain regions that we're going to sequence. The hippocampus was simply the first one on the list because we knew something about it, but there are definitely reasons to believe that, for instance, the prefrontal cortex would be involved or other brain regions as well. So yeah, that's one of the things on our, our to-do list when we have you know, a million dollars is to sequence all those different regions. Ellen? So given the experimental design, did you see more or, or different amounts of variance in expression between the social and the solitaries? And if so, which direction did it go? You know, my intuition, I haven't looked at that systematically. My intuition is that there is a little more variation in the social mm -hmm. treatment group. But like I say, I haven't looked at that enough to really kind of tell for sure. Because that in itself would be kind of interesting. Mm, for sure, yeah. It seems like it might be a more varied environment. Yes, I agree completely. Uh, at the back? Yeah. So, so assuming, like, limitless uh, funds and work to sequence yes. everything. What, what is potentially built into this study or the future studies that come from it to eliminate sort of, so you just hunt and sequence regions until you find ones that show more differences, but what, how do you eliminate just sort of your, your bias towards wanting to be like, oh, well, this is the region that finally shows the differences, so that must be the driver of this. Well, how do you eliminate all the alternative hypotheses that don't care what the expression of a particular gene is, because that's not really... When you say region, do you mean which region in the brain? Yeah. I mean, so, so, say you, like, you did this for a hundred different tissues in an individual. You'd eventually maybe find one that had more differential expression, but even then that doesn't necessarily show 
how do you eliminate alternate hypotheses rather than just cherry pick the one with the best numbers? Yeah, I, that's certainly a problem, and I think the you know the easy answer, given unlimited funding, of course, is you know is that we test them all using say RNAi, where we can really um, you know go from the correlational type you know uh, experiment to the causation. And so, you know, ideally, in, in this limitless, you know, scenario, we would have, you know, 100 genes that all looked good on paper, you know, or on computer, then we go back through and test those and, and say, a, you know, a really rigorous way. I, I, sort of that limitless, exper uh, you know, experiment, though, I'm not sure there's a great way. Anybody? I was just curious how um, the, the, the solitary and Social animals were, were they raised similarly in similar ages or, or maturational? Ages? Yeah, yeah. Everything was the same. So they're fed the same thing. They have the same, um, you know, uh, lights on, lights off. I forget what the word is called. Yeah, I mean, really everything is the same. They're, um, I don't know how close in age were they, Julie? Those are all the same. Same. So yeah. almost identical in age. So really, it was you know thanks to Julie, really a very tightly controlled experiment. And genetically. Siblings um, I don't know. Siblings, I think we tried not to, but I don't know how, how much we were... I mean, everybody's related. This population was derived from, you know, how many Tucos, you know, not very many Tucos. So at some level, everything, you know, they're all related, you know, fairly closely. But as much as possible, no, we, we didn't choose siblings for the same experiment. Uh, have you found any genes that are screened out as, like, low coverage genes? Yeah, there's tons of genes like that, and that's one of the one of the things I'm I'm in, sorry one of the things I'm really interested in following up on is you have and you can't see it back there probably but there's a whole you know list of genes here that are you know some here that are really highly expressed in the social but not at all in the solitary very little and same thing up here you can maybe see these a little bit better where there's all these dots up here which represent you know no expression in the social and fairly high you know I think this one times or 10 to 1.5 or 2 I can't read the numbers there but pretty reasonable expression so yeah there are definitely examples of that. Do we have a rough idea like which functional category do they belong to? Um, Not yet that's one, that that whole go annotation stuff is stuff that I'm I'm yet to do. I actually overwrote my files accidentally this morning. <laughs> Darko. Uh, so thinking in alternative I thought so here you're, you're focusing the possibility that differential gene expression explains that, but what if what explains social behavior is differential n neural connectivity with the same gene expression? How do you get these apart? Uh, I don't, I mean, maybe a neuroscientist could. Yeah, I think there are all those, you know, things, I think some of those things we're actually working on, the, like things like receptor distribution, Stuff like that, I think we're you know we're in the process of tackling. But but me myself, I didn't, I unfortunately know very little about about that aspect of kind of brain function. So met along the same lines, you focus here on gene expression, which is logical and, and, and cool. What about alternative splicing? There are many different ways to yes. cut these. Yeah, and some of, right. some of these things are definitely, there is some redundancy in the data set, and some of those things are isoforms and stuff like that. This is, this is analysis that, you know, that we'll have to wait until our genome comes. I think once we have our Tuco genome, we'll really be able to get at this alternative splicing isoform issue really well. Definitely that could be an important, you know, driver, you know, cause or consequence, I guess, I don't know which. I don't know. I don't know a lot about the species or their behavior, but I was just wondering if you, A, watch the actual behavior of the animals, um, or even if you tried not to watch it, did you notice that any of them that you like put in the solitary situation, or they put in the social situation kind of made themselves solitary within the social situation? Yeah, I know that, that there are, you know, literally like, you know, 10 years times 24 hours, you know, 10 years times 52 weeks times, you know, there's a lot of video data out there. And Julie's watched, you know, you know, several thousand hours. And I don't know, you know, if these particular animals were watched, uh, but I know that we've, we, meaning Julie and her, you know, Julie and Eileen, they've watched a lot of, you know, videos. So I don't know if animals segregate like that, 
Julie and Eileen? Not obviously. That the ones that were housed in groups, you know, consistently you go in, they're all huddled up together. It wasn't as if some of them, you know, some individuals isolated themselves from the social group or anything like that. There was nothing that conspicuous. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to have to draw it to a close and let people get to class. Um, so, Matt, thank you very much. Yeah. And Alan, please. Yeah.